Uh, so hello, uh, my name is Lowell, uh, pronouns he, him, and this is a talk, discussion, uh, seminar, workshop, uh, not sure what we're going to call it, uh, talking about world building and collaboration in world building uh, in particular. Uh, and uh, I do this because I love session zero. Uh, it is, it is, I, I honestly... It is my favorite part of, of any game. Uh, I don't know why. I mean, I enjoy the rest of the game, but uh, there's something I really dig about the working together, the people showing me what's what they have as ideas and us all bringing it together in that session zero. It's, it is a delight and a joy. It may be why I like Legacy Life Among the Ruins so much because it's session zero is so long that it bleeds into session one. Uh, uh, but it has lots of really good tools. Uh, so collaboration here in terms of world building and play uh, is where I'm talking about where the players are building some or all of the world in the course of the process. And in this case, we're leaning more towards uh, uh, more involvement uh, uh, with that process rather than just the simple, okay, we've made our character and that's to find some things. How do we expand that? How do we do develop that? And there are several reasons to do that that I think are really important. Uh, one is collaboration, obviously, and we've seen in, in lots of indie games and PBTA games and things like that, it increases player buy-in. Uh, uh, players own a part of the world and uh, they get to say something about it and they feel connected to it. Uh, Another thing that it goes with that, though, is that process of collaboration puts everybody, GM and players, on the same level, on the same page. There's no one who knows a lot more about the setting than another person. It helps establish that baseline because uh, that can be a challenge. I am just starting a Star Trek Adventures campaign, and we have one player uh who has never watched Star Trek. They said, I've seen the movie with the whales, but that is the extent of their knowledge and they know who Picard is. Uh, so that's going to be really interesting when we get to play, like uh, working on that. And it's a little harder to do it with an established setting, uh, but I think there are ways to, to bring that in. Uh, the other thing about doing collaborative world building that I'm going to say is it is reduced workload for the GM. Uh, uh, it is a little bit of a cheat, but I think that uh, uh, we can get into that mode uh, to use that to help us to develop things and things that we wouldn't think of, ideas that we wouldn't have. Uh, uh, it is a writer's room feeling that goes on. And the other thing about that, I'll say this, is uh, I have been guilty in the past uh, of overriding, over prepping, over building, uh, writing great gazetteers up for nations and all of that stuff and, and doing all of that work. And then none of that mattering at the table, none of it. So, uh, one of the things is, is that collaborative world building means that the world building that we're doing is, is at the table. It is getting to the table. It's either in the player's minds or, or you know, and, or we're seeing it throughout the, the course of play. So uh, there is a thing I tell myself when I paint miniatures is uh, I don't paint where they can't see. Uh, I don't wait my time on that. I focus in on what, what people can see at the table. And now I try to do that with a uh, collaborative world building. Uh, it also shares besides lo uh, lowering that uh, workload, it shares that burden of trying to remember everything of trying to keep track of everything. Once everybody has a piece of that knowledge, then you can consult with other people about that. Um, uh, and quite honestly, players are going to find and develop in the course of play, if we give them permission to, fruitful gaps, places where we haven't thought about something where we can draw and, and because they've been given permission at the start to collaborate, they're allowed to collaborate throughout and they're going to find great places where they can add on to that. Uh, so the flip side to that is where does this work less well? I think it still can work, but it, it, it where there are, are challenges to it. Uh, it's where 
the canon is already tightly developed and intricate. Star Trek Adventures has a lot of, of genre assumptions, but also specific assumptions about the setting and about the universe. Uh, and if you want to get away from those, you're going to have to you know, choose a different time or really say we're going to be doing a, a high, high variant on it. Uh, it can also be uh, a thing when players are coming to a particular game because they want an introduction to the setting. They, they've they heard about this, they've heard about Planescape, or they've heard about Eberron, and they're excited to, to do that. And that's a question of recognizing what the player's desires are and being cognizant of that. Um, a few other things is uh, there are some games where the setting itself is so deeply tied to the mechanics of the game that working towards a collaborative version of it would take a lot of retooling. It potentially, uh, uh, players don't have pieces of information that they need to have because of what the settings does. Uh, I would say uh, that, for example, RuneQuest's Glorantha, uh, which I quite love, uh, is really deeply baked like the assumptions about how the, the deities work and things like that and the, the cultural premises and things, it's tough to do a collaborative approach unless you kind of zoom in a little bit more. Uh, another game I'll mention, uh, Cryptomancer, is an amazing game. Lots of great ideas in it, but it has a whole set of very specific things about how information and data magic and the, the people's work in it that that you have to like for the game to work in terms of what it wants you to do this fantasy hacking game you kind of have to work with that setting and it makes it tougher for you to find the spaces to do the collaboration uh it's also tougher if you're playing a game where you're expecting to add players later on uh, uh, if you're expecting that you're going to be running this for a long time and add players on because then you get a party of, of people who do know the setting and are, are involved in it. And maybe somebody comes in and they feel like they're on an outsider group to it. Uh, so that's something you have to be thinking about is how you then bring those people in. Other thing is this, is uh, I know all of you have played a lot of indie games and things like that. And so uh, we're in a culture here uh, on Open Hearth and on online play of trusting one another uh but sometimes you will get players who uh don't have that level of trust they haven't had that experience of collaborating uh of of working with with one another and that can even happen in a case where players have played together for a long time when i first brought microscope to the table to to, to try it out as the idea of like setting up a game i had a couple of my players who were like really nervous about it because they were worried that the other players were going to fuck the world up, that that they were going to mess things up. And they were worried about that. It wasn't until they got into play and saw how it worked that that they calmed down. But you should recognize that if, if you're hitting a bump and you're wondering why a player is reacting in a particular way, that may be what's going on is is they're not yet used to that that culture of trust. Uh the other thing I want to mention is that entering into a more fully collaborative world building approach uh, is even more than we do in a lot of our, our uh, indie games and our session zeros. As a GM, it is much more letting go. You have to be willing to listen, have to be willing to take in players' input. You have to be willing to do that reincorporation, not just at the beginning, but later on to show players that their contributions are valued. And you have to give up your assumptions in an even more strong way than, than maybe you otherwise might. It is, it is a real yes and. Um, uh, and there are some challenges to that when we go through the process of collaboration. Uh, sometimes players won't be on the same page as you, or they'll, say that they're on the same page but then when you actually get to play they're not actually on the same page uh and you have to be willing to go with that one example was i tried to run 
Strixhaven for D&D 5e. And uh, I talked about what we wanted and assumptions and and uh, like we did a little bit of world building about what the, the place was going to be like. And, you know, uh, uh, talked about the kind of mid tone sort of maybe even towards the darker elements of Harry Potter, that the sort of threat that went on. And I was very well aware of I was like, this is going to be great. Uh, and then we got to play and the players went, we uh, and went went straight gonzo uh, right out of the gate. And they were all enjoying themselves. Uh, uh, they are all uh, into it. It wasn't what I was expecting. It wasn't what I thought we had developed. But you know, I had to 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 let go and and let it run its course. Uh, the other thing about this, and this is just a mechanical kind of technical piece with the idea of collaboration, is as a GM sometimes we want to be very kind of free and open and uh, about this and collaboration is about being open about it but it's also about being a traffic manager it's about managing the the questions it's about managing the players it's about sharing that around to people uh and we have to be aware that some players are more vocal some players are more active. Some players are more interested in this. Uh, and that we have to, to make sure that we are drawing out the voices that aren't being heard, that we are managing and stopping players who are, you know, maybe stepping on other people's toes. If you've played any kind of cooperative board game, uh, pandemic it being the archetype of this, there is always that worry that one player will quarterback and try and lead how everything is. So you've got to be aware and manage that uh, as, as gently as you can. So that's kind of the, the setup to this. So let me talk about the tools. Uh, and of course, in any kind of collaborative world building uh, discussion, uh, uh, we're going to start with the, the game that I think has really changed the dynamic of, of how this works, and that is Microscope. Microscope is, is a great game. If you haven't played it, I highly recommend that you do. Uh, I have used Microscope, I would say now, uh, eight or nine times to build campaigns and long, long standing campaigns, campaigns that have run for, for a couple of years. Uh, and I have been pleased every time with that. Now, Microscope has you building a history. Uh, you build these eras, and then below the eras are events that are kind of chronologically ordered within that. And then in the original microscope, there would be scenes underneath an event where you kind of zoom in and play out a scene to uh, uh, answer a question. Uh, in terms of how I handle this, instead of that zoom in, we let players ask a question about a particular scene and then throw that to another player or answer that question themselves. So we stay in that kind of collaborative world building mode rather than kind of zooming down to, to RP. Uh, one of the best things that we can take, even if we're not going to do the timeline, not going to build the, 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 the history with microscope, microscope introduces the idea of the palette. Uh, the idea that we're going to build a list of things that uh, are kind of our, they call it the ad band list with the palette, uh, being adding things that we might not usually expect to have in this kind of genre or this kind of game, or things that would be common in this kind of game that we don't want to see. I loosen that up a little and basically do say, what do we want to see more of? What do we want to see less of? Uh, it's it's a great way to ground your players together, uh, get them on the same page. Uh, and uh, I recommend when you do that, uh, doing that in a, in a, a once round, letting people add one thing because people have, some people have lots of ideas uh, uh, and moving around and checking in on things. Uh, it's It's a really easy technique. Uh, especially if you've got a game that has maybe some more open uh, flavor. We played uh, The Veil recently, 
uh, which is really building that cyberpunk world up. And we spent a long lot of time building that palette to get the elements that people wanted to see because the genre is so broad. What do we want to narrow down to? Uh, now, Microscope generally covers a history and you figure that out and you can uh, uh, handle that. But there are several changes that we can make to Microscope if we want to use it in a particular way. One of the biggest changes that you can make is you can define the time periods much more narrowly. Uh, in microscope, time period generally can cover eras, ages, decades, centuries. Uh, but you can narrow it down and say, this is going to cover a period of 20 years, or this is going to cover just one year. And that changes things. It focuses in uh, on particular uh, elements. And I think that that's really a, a, a way to get a kind of a tight uh, uh, setup. Uh, now, the other thing with that is you can strongly establish what the beginning point and end point is for your history. One of the things that I've done a couple of times uh, when I've done the campaign is I have a very specific prompt to start and a very specific prompt to end. And that is uh, uh, the death of Queen X. Is That's the era. I start that out. And then the last era is the hunts begin. And I have no idea what that means. No clue. Uh, but we set a prompt. We set a open concept uh, uh, that uh, the, the players can build onto. And uh, in particular, when we do that last era, setting up something that we think we can jump off to. The hunts begin, suggest that something terrible or tragic is is about to occur and that's the the time that our players come into uh we can also use certain factors uh elements of uh 13th age to do things beyond just setting up the historical events there is a space that happens at the end of each round of microscope where players kind of go back and look at something that's established and 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 say something about that instead of doing that that's an opportunity to have players establish a deity or establish a faction or a group or uh, an icon in there uh so you're building kind of a parallel track of things uh that kind of go outside the history then then other people can reincorporate that or they can connect it to things that are already established uh my favorite way to use microscope especially if we know that we're going to be playing an urban game we're going to be playing a fantasy urban game or post-apocalypse or whatever is rather than using microscope to build a history we use microscope to build a city uh in this case uh we have a list of neighborhoods that's our eras and then below that players can add locations or people and then nested beneath that are rumors about the those locations or people. Uh, it's super fun. Uh, uh, like I really enjoy doing that. Uh, it's a great way to get uh, some hooks that players are going to right away want to go to. They're going to want to associate themselves with particular places or people or neighborhoods. And they're going to have already built up a sense mentally of the geography of the city I, I i love that piece one of the other things that you can use uh microscope for is filling in the spaces between campaigns if you are running multiple campaigns and okay we're going to do a 20 years later you can fill that in uh it's really exciting, especially if you've got players who played in that first campaign who are continuing on to the second one, um, and you are not going to get what you think you were going to get. If you have an expectation about, okay, this is how this campaign ended, I, I know where we're going to go, it will not go that way. Every time I've used it to do that, it goes wildly off from that. Uh, 
uh, another technique uh, that I, I recommend is if you have a piece of media that has ended that you want to play in that universe, and again, Star Wars is the obvious option, one of the, the things, if if all the players know about uh, using those, those techniques, uh, uh, about using that genre, uh, you can build like, okay, what happens? What happens after this particular movie? What comes next? Uh, and it's a great way to, to build on to established settings. Uh, the one thing I will mention about Microscope before I go too much further is this. I'm, I'm dwelling too much, perhaps on one tool. Uh, players will inevitably make things worse for themselves in Microscope. Uh, in Microscope, you label events as light or dark. Uh, uh, players gravitate towards dark, uh, and they will 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 have more of those. And then, as you get towards the end of your Microscope collaborative building uh, thing, they will suddenly realize what they have done. And there will be a desperate scramble in that last section of the the play for them to get some things that are uh, uh, brighter, lighter, maybe not so uh, 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 dire for for the group. It is it has happened every single time. I thought at first it was just just a random thing, but it has happened every single time. Uh, so there are other big picture tools that we can use. Uh, Cliff mentioned in uh, the uh, chat there, uh, a quiet year. There are a lot of these world building or kind of world exploring games. Uh, a quiet year could be used to zoom in on a particular uh, uh, era, a particular chance to explore what's happening in a place. It's another game that has a sense of time and building up. Uh, I would say... There's Follow from Ben Robbins, who wrote Microscope. There's Kingdom. These are, are ways to explore particular smaller stories within a setting, either in combination with Microscope or just to explore particular facets of it that can allow you to establish uh, some backstory. Uh, I have a very rough game of uh, Tarot building to build a tarot deck for a world uh, uh, called uh, uh, Arcana uh, uh, Inumanata. Uh, and it's about uh, setting that up so we establish some ideas of what the symbols are of the world, about what the history is of the world, and using that as a means of kind of creating, for especially for a fantasy setting, uh, what the vibe is for it. Um, and again, uh, uh, a Quiet Year, games like uh, Companion's Tale, uh, For the Queen, I think all of these could be used uh, as like one-shot things to do additional collaborative world building. Uh, I've uh, heard uh, of a long-running Ars Magica campaign uh, that uh, uh, one of the uh, my uh, players has been doing. They, they've been doing this an online group. And in between sort of arcs of that, they stop and they've played stories kind of in that same setting, but with different games to explore other facets, to build up more details. For example, they used Apillion, the, the dragon baby game, uh, to do like young mages uh, uh, and what what their lives are like in the, 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 the setting. Uh, and I think we can be, be creative about that. Uh, it's a, a good way to uh, let the players establish some details and details uh, through play. Uh, one of the other techniques that's great in terms of doing this collaborative world building that's kind of more big scale meta is uh, the uh, map building. Uh, we There's a number of games that use that. I mentioned Legacy and Free from the Yoke that. Uh, another tool that's out there is this Deck of Worlds is a card driven uh, game for building up maps and things. That's a very uh, physical 
uh, a tactile thing if you're playing face to face uh, that you can use to do that. Uh, I'll show you one of the things if you're doing an online uh, map building. Uh, there are a, a number of ways that you can do that. I used to do it using Google Draw, and then I found that. Uh, Google had jam boards, which were great because you could lay a background in and the players couldn't move it. And of course, as soon as I started to use that, Google retired it and they're going to end it next year. Uh, but there are other things like Miro uh, and and such. Uh, one of the things you can do to make map building easier for the players uh, and more, more interesting is uh, there are a number of different icon packs that you can find uh, on drive through or uh, uh, there's uh, fantasy map icons, I think is the name of it, uh, that have little pieces and artwork and things that you can then set up as a folder that players can draw from and drop in. And I'll give you an example here of what that looks like. I'm going to screen share here for just a moment. Uh, so, this is a map from uh, uh, the Free from the Shadow, which is a samurai fantasy game. This is using Google Jamboard. And as you can see, uh, I've got a lot of uh, different icons. Players are able to go into the folders and grab those and resize them. Uh, and uh, players enjoy that because they didn't have to try to learn the drawing tools. Uh, uh, to do things, didn't have to try and and draw symbols or 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 uh, things, uh, and it's a it's a useful thing. It requires some setup, uh, but I think the payoff is pretty good. Okay, I am now since it's thirty minutes of me straight talking. I'm going to take a big old slug of this coffee here. So hang on one second. So the biggest thing, the most common thing that I know we've all seen is uh, questions as the collaborative tool when we're playing. Uh, and there are a number of different ways that that happens. And I want to walk through those. And I maybe want to talk about some ones that maybe you haven't considered uh, using that that are, are really useful. Uh, uh, so... Obviously, the most common collaboration comes uh, by leaving space and asking questions of character creation. Uh, when I run Heart Su Wulin, I come in with only the premise that we're doing a wuxia romance melodrama game. I don't know exactly what the world is like. Through the players, I'm going to find out what the factions are. I'm going to find out uh, what they're about, what's going on in the world. We leave those spaces. After they've introduced their characters, I'm going to ask them some leading questions to, to get more out of them. That's, that's I think, one of the most common things. We see that in Apocalypse World uh, uh, and other games that come in with a premise, a vibe, but without a specific world. Now, uh, characters that people choose by their uh, very nature are going to establish some, some things about, about that world. Uh, I would say one of the most interesting examples of this is the way that the world for masks is built. There are certain playbooks that people can choose when you play masks, uh, a new generation, that really focus on defining what the history of the world is, what the world looks like right now. There's the, the scion, uh, there's the legacy, there's a the soldier, The all three of these really establish some facts about the world. Uh, there's also the brain that establishes some facts about like what super science looks like. A lot of those playbooks have some areas that they get to have authority in and establish. Uh, there are some playbooks that don't. Uh, uh, and I think as a result, they are a little less interesting perhaps. Uh, the Nova is a very cool very easy to to gravitate towards playbook, but it's not one that really helps to find what the world looks like. Uh, a lot of the other playbooks uh, do that. Uh, so 
that's that's what we can get. Like, obviously, the sort of lowest level is through character creation, through what we let players uh, have authority on. Tell us what your elf clan is like uh, uh, or what what uh, uh, town you come from. Those are all things that help us define what the world would give players permission to do that. It's one of the things that is important if you're playing with some people that maybe you haven't before. They may not know what their permissions are. Uh, uh, in terms of play, in terms of collaboration, in terms of world building. Uh, so in that early stages, if you are giving them uh, the leeway to say things about the world through their characters, you want to model that for them. You want to encourage them to do that. You want to spend some time drawing them out. Uh, uh, if they've played in traditional groups, they may be very reluctant uh, to do that. They They may not feel like they have the right or the permission to say things about the world. So you as a a, a game facilitator uh, can make that clear for them. Uh, the other sort of step up is, of course, uh, working from an established uh, set of questions. Uh, these are our are, are set things that we're going to ask before we start. Uh, I would if you're interested in looking at how one person uh, approaches this, uh, I would say that uh, this book by James D'Amato, uh, the RPG Game Master's World Building Guide, uh, it's, it's a book just of questions, just of prompts for different kinds of things. Uh, you can find it relatively uh, cheap online. Uh, it's a nice, very light paperback. I honestly went in not expecting much, uh, uh, but it it was really great. Like it was a fun read. Uh, it had lots of interesting ideas about what kinds of things you could ask. And while it's presented a little more GM facing, it does talk about the idea of how you present this to a player and how you get them to work through a uh, collaboration. Uh, another example recently is we've seen uh, a Girl by Moonlight. Uh, just released from Evil Hat. It has four campaign settings. And uh, for each one of those series, there are a set of questions that you work through with the players. Uh, some of them very abstract uh, and some of them a little more concrete. Uh, and those uh, uh, really frame up what what the play is going to be about. And they're a really good example of how you might build a campaign questionnaire. If you have a strong sense of what your pitch is, of what your genre is, you can use this to uh, narrow it down. Uh, there are other games that do this through letting people play elements of the setting, like a lot of the belonging outside belonging games uh, have uh, uh, places where the players can take up a particular piece of the setting. Uh, and answer some questions about that. Another example of a game which does this approach to questions and answers in a very striking way is uh, Spectaculars, uh, is a superhero game. This booklet is just a booklet of the setting. And there are, there are these different campaign pads for working through the different stories. And in this booklet, uh, there are uh, things like, okay, uh, let's talk about what the catastrophe was. And the players, when we go to that, when that event occurs, you name it, you've got uh, a set of pick list questions for it, uh, and you establish that, and you write that in this book. And over time, the player group uh, builds up a history, uh, a unique history of the world by answering these particular aspects and areas. That one is a lot of work. I can't imagine uh, uh, copying that uh, for your own game unless you wanted to spend a lot more time. Uh, uh, pick lists are great, uh, particularly when you do them modestly. Uh, this one has pick lists with a lot of writing with the pick lists uh, uh, that that I I would not uh, necessarily want to to try. Uh, One of the other things I want to mention about the idea of providing questions and pick lists and things like that is as a game facilitator, you want to look at those questions because some of the questions are not 
as interesting as other ones. Some of them may, by the nature of themselves, given what has already been established, kind of point in a particular direction. You want to make sure that players that get maybe those questions in the turn order equally get a, a more interesting one later. That That is a, another that issue of traffic management. You want to be aware of that. You want to make sure that everybody gets to say something really amazingly cool about the setting. They get to, to do that. Uh, and that is a place where you as a game facilitator really need to be kind of closely monitoring things. You want to make sure that players are listening to one another, that they have heard what the others have said, and that when they answer a question, they are not negating an answer given by a previous player. And the important thing with that is when that happens, when you're seeing that, like something that player B says kind of goes against what player A has already established or answered in a previous question, uh, the thing is not to say, no, we've already established that, is to ask them, how does that fit with what we've already established? Stop, ask them that, and they may have an answer or they may revise what they're saying, but give them the opportunity to, to do that. Uh, uh, again, world building, session zero, is the place where you really want to be careful about saying no. I think even more than when we're at the table playing, we want to be really positive about things. Um, I want to kind of skip a little bit forward. I want to talk about another technique for doing this question world building. We've got like these campaign setups, these big lists of questions that we might ask. Another technique that I think is really amazingly interesting is what Fraser Simons did with The Veil. Now, The Veil is a cyberpunk PBTA game, but it's more uh, an approach to modern cyberpunk and those tropes and genre elements and so on. And it has no established world. There are some built-in assumptions kind of in some of the playbooks, but not much. Instead, what each playbook does is it gets to say something about the world. So we have the character that's known as the architect. This is our hacker, our virtual reality manipulator. Uh, uh, they, they have a, a focus on that. They're the ones that get to tell us what that looks like. They get to say what VR looks like, what interacting with the network looks like, what hacking looks like, what the limits of it are. And those are questions that are built into that playbook. Uh, there are uh, playbooks that talk about what it means to uh, be an artificial intelligence. Uh, there are playbooks that get to talk about what environmental uh, issues look like in the setting. Each one of those playbooks has a piece of authority. And just by choosing a particular playbook, you are saying that these issues, these topics are important to our play. And then that player gets to define some uh, uh, pieces about that. It's amazing at the table. It builds an entirely different world each time, depending on your mix of players. And because they've chosen a character that does a particular thing and they get to say what it's like they they feel like they have some control they 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 haven't taken a net runner and then when they get to the table the net runner doesn't work like what they think it does you know we've, we've seen this in in games where people are like oh i'll take you know take a druid that obviously does this or a ranger it does this and then when it gets to the table that's that's not in fact what the game looks like uh so that's a really uh a great way to to do that now I took that in uh, a different direction, but building on that, just to show you how you can uh, do that, uh, I'm running Hearts of Yoka, uh, sorry, uh, 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 Free from the Shadow. I uh, showed you the map for that. This is a fantasy samurai game. It is built on Free from the Yoke, so it has two levels uh, of the, you choose a clan, a family that you come from, and then you choose a character. One of the things I did was 
I rewrote that and I made it so that each clan, each family gets to define something about the world. So for example, we have the clan that's focused on magic. They get to say what magic looks like. We don't come in with any uh, assumptions. Now uh, to do that, I've given them a uh, list of uh, questions with some uh, picks for that. Uh, so let me kind of do that. Uh, so I, I, uh, I, I'm just gonna go ahead and screen share this briefly here. So here for the mystical clan, uh, I've got a question and a set of short answers. And so like the first one is your family defines magic. You get to tell us about its source or sources as well as general feeling. And then I have a big list and players can choose one or they can choose multiple of these and combine them together. Uh, I've also got a set of questions about like what the magical world like looks like. How are... Uh, the mages, the, the people who practice magic, uh, treated. Uh, this is just one example. Uh, we have a clan of non-humans. So the non-humans get to define like what the non-human role is within the setting. And they get to define what kind of peoples exist in the setting. Uh, uh, we have uh, the uh, elegant uh, playbook here with the sort of the sophisticated cultural thing, they get to decide what arts are most important. They get to say which ones are most important, say why. They also get to say which ones are kind of looked down on now. They kind of do these interesting aesthetic choices about the world. Uh, and much like uh, how the veil operates, this is a way of giving players authority over things. Uh, I'll kind of uh, skip forward here uh, a little bit, and I want to talk about the idea of using collaboration to manage existing settings about uh, things. Uh, uh, so one of the th problems is sometimes is we see a game and it looks super cool. Like we look at the art we look at the images and the, the premise and we are like, oh, that looks great. I am, I am super excited. This happened to me yesterday. I happened to be glancing through some things and I saw a game called Household. Household is an Italian game and it is gorgeous. It, it's one of the prettiest games I've ever seen. And the idea of household is that you, there's an, like an empty, abandoned house and you play little people who are in this house, little sort of fairy fay people who are in this. And each of the different rooms are a different uh, nation for the house. And it's about stories of exploring the house. And there are, there are foes that are going on and all of that. It looks great. Like it looks so cool. And I took, downloaded the quick start. The quick start is like about a hundred pages. And there is so much lore and so much background and so much like deep things. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, holy moly, how would I ever get that across to the players? Would I have them read this, this big honking book? Uh, do we, do we, do I have to like info dump during play? Uh, these are the kinds of games that, 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 that do that, that establish so much lore. They, they love their lore. They get the pretty pictures and things, but they become much more difficult to get to the table. So the question is, how do we approach that? And that's, I think, the trick is for us to look at that and boil it down to like what the base premise is. You know, we've got little people. They're in an abandoned house. They have some magical talents. That's cool. They've uh, uh, worked and uh, uh, they're adapting particular things. Different parts of the house are different factions. Those are the only things we really need to know. 
quite honestly. Let's we can like let's set that as the base premise. Oh, that's all we need for the pitch. And then what we can do if we for our collaboration, we can go, okay, let's have everybody define a faction. Maybe we've got a pick list of the different factions, or maybe we come up with like different factions that represent different kind of archetypes, like here's a martial faction, or here's a one that is about exploration. And we make some pick lists or some questions about that. Uh, that allows us entry in. We can still use the pictures from the book, uh, uh, which is a huge cheat. Uh, but we can get that premise. We can get that vibe that we really like, and we can drill down on it. Uh, uh, I think that that allows you to take these things that are cool. It it justifies your purchases. Like if if you like me have bought games that when you actually go to look at them, you're like, I don't know how I would ever run this. Like I have all the Iron Kingdoms books. I think they look really cool. Uh, that may be my 12 year old uh, boy brain going on there. Uh, but but you know we've got steampunk robots and mages and stuff. Uh, but holy cow, there is way too much world. So if I were going to approach that, I would try to break down what it is about Iron Kingdoms that I like and how we would uh, get to that uh, entry point. Uh, so we, as, as I say in my show notes here, we're going to boil down the cool. We figure out what the essential elements are. Uh, one of the places that I think one of the examples that maybe uh, some of us know is Blades in the Dark. I think Blades in the Dark, uh, obviously Forge in the Dark, a fun game, and it's got a really cool look to it. Uh, but it also has some particular uh, setups in terms of setting choices and things like that, that uh, maybe for some players uh, uh, push them out don't give them uh, as much access. Uh, so the question is, what are the minimal things we need to say to define a setting that looks like Blades in the Dark? And I would say steampunk urban city. I would say gloom, like uh, uh, in Blades in the Dark, Duskfall is constantly in darkness. We don't necessarily have to do that, but the generally that that gloom and the vibe of that. Uh, I would say the idea that there are ghosts, but maybe we let the players define what the ghosts are like. Uh, and I would say factions, that there are these different factions at different tier levels, but again, that's something that we can then allow players to define. We kind of go from that initial premise and we build up from that. So uh, like that's how I would approach Duskfall if I were to run it again. Uh, I would really look at letting the players say, who are our major characters? Who are our major factions? Uh, what kinds of forces are at play? Uh at, at, with the ghosts and the magic, letting players choose from a kind of set of things. Uh, you want to make sure that those don't necessarily uh, break what goes on on certain playbooks, but let them have the freedom to define that. Uh, and I think that's uh, a really strong way to, to get entry uh, into that. Um, so I've talked now for about 50 minutes. Uh, so I want to see if folks have uh, uh, other techniques uh, that that they have uh, seen that they're interested in talking about or questions that they have about particular things, how you would approach things or th uh, things. Steph, would you mind, you mentioned uh, in the chat, Court of Blades. Do you, can, can you tell us a, a bit about that? Uh, yes. Uh, Court of Blades is a fortunate art game about courtly drama think uh like the three musketeers or some sort of like pseudo historical italian uh city uh it still has the uh blades in the dark weirdness with its magic with like the undead and whatnot uh but however 
one of the unique things about the system from the get-go, it incorporates the factions into the mechanics of the system. Whatever uh, group playbooks that the players don't pick automatically become uh, tiered based on uh, the GM's uh, like own little mechanics because the GM has a mechanical turn rather than the uh, ambiguity of Blades in the Dark of like, oh yeah, the, there's clocks and whatnot. No, it specifically states after every so many uh, errands that uh, or uh, heists they go on, you do this stuff to upkeep all the factions in the game. And I do mean all of the factions in the game and I have no idea about how to handle it and it scares me so much because I'm running a Quarter Blades game oh, right wow. now. Yeah, uh, Greenlaw of Varkith, which was a Dungeon World setting, has a, a little bit of that. Like it has a whole turn where you have to decide on an action for each one of the factions. You have to resolve it and you have to figure that out. Uh, but but what you're saying sounds even more more deep and and rich. That's great. Yeah, it, it's it's a fantastical faction game. Uh, and like a, a like a, so far like a lot of recommendations i've gotten for people is just to remove it and i'm like i i don't want to remove it that's what this is why i got the game i want to play with the factions to give me the factions but like i don't know how to keep notes for that mm -hmm. and like i saw the little map that you made and i'm i i would like how does that work especially with like in tandem with like physical notes about like hey this is where this place is at because i for much as I love Court of Blades, it has the worst map I have ever seen in a game. Uh, I cannot read it. Uh, so, like, I have no idea where anything is at. So, yeah, if 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 the actual map isn't baked in, like, like we have to know distances and things like that, I think it's really easy to like with with what what I do often is I kind of give a rough sketch. Like, here's mm -hmm. general the general shape of things, and I'll put that there, uh, and then. You know, uh, in that first round in the uh, map building, each person got to define a, uh, a, a a place. They get to define where their homestead is or their home city mm -hmm. is. Uh, and then they got to define uh, some elements about uh, here are some bad places and here are some good places on the map. And we just kind of did it once around. Everybody got, I think, three things they were able to put on the map. So four players three things that's about 12 objects that's that's reasonable of uh, uh, to put on the map and for me to remember what they are yeah uh because uh, it's it is very easy to to put too much stuff on there and get it overwhelmed uh, but but i think it does it acts as a memory thing the players are going to remember what the cities are or the places or things uh that that helps uh, generally again sharing the cognitive load Mm -hmm. making things easier because i do i run three or four games a week and so anything i can do to reduce the cognitive load and remember where we are is is really helpful uh uh other ideas suggestions comments uh questions um i'll share uh that i can't wait to play court of blades i heard a actual play uh one day and that yeah that's exciting and to I hear your question about that. Um, uh, last year, I, gosh, I, I guess a, a couple of related things. I remember when the Invisible Sun came out and they had like, you know, what kind of play, which I attached directly to world building, you know, do you want to do mm -hmm. when you're playing? And I think their list was something like explore, attain, achieve, and build. And I'm realizing that I'm all about that world building and that collaborative stuff which i'm still trying to find you know the group to to make that uh happen with uh, but it has to be all of those uh, mm -hmm. it, and and certainly depending on the, the the types of players you have you know adapting to to that when when they say well here's here are my wishes or yes no's and maybes and things but last year i had done a hack of blades for uh, a guerrilla theater group that could jump multi multiple universes uh and we only did a session session zero for it but it was the most wonderful thing 
although we were stumbling over some technical things and mm-hmm. the blades mechanics. But very quickly, it went from I had this concept of a double planetoid Escher style um, to it suddenly went back to, you know, Judd recently on Daydreaming About Dragons was talking about questions. And very quickly, it became pick lists. And Mm -hmm. then the buy-in, the excitement, the, oh my gosh, we are, you know, this can go places kicked in. And it was a proto world building session. So, hurrah to your list. Yeah, I, I, I love pick lists i think think they are 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 super fun uh one of the things i will all say is whenever you do a pick list at the end it should say other like in parentheses you should always make sure that players know that this is a list of examples and and we can can build uh from there um I, I, I'm going to show everybody uh, another screen share of my favorite recent of these things. So I'm running a drift of changing the lost uh, with a kind of a different cosmology uh, that that's going on. And one of the things is that uh, they are uh, getting to define what the courts of the setting are. Uh, so they're, each of the courts is associated with a emotion. So uh, uh, anger, fear, uh, uh, sadness, and joy. Uh, And uh, I've had them each associate that with a a symbol, like a tarot suit. Uh, So in our game, we have uh, the court of towers, we have the court of tides, uh, uh, and players get to do that. And then they get to associate some traits with that. Uh, and so I got a big list of of traits that they can choose from. Uh, they get to pick three of those. And that's created some really interesting and different uh, courts. But, and this is dumb, but this is my favorite part of this. I'm going to scroll forward. Uh, so uh, here's the question. The question is, what other threats exist in the city? Uh, and for this, I did a, a, a two parallel lists uh and you pick one from a and one from b so you might have uh 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 punk shape changers or one of the other threats it could be uh luchador fairies uh uh uh, or it could be fanatic ghosts uh uh these kinds of two-part combination things i adore i think it's a great way if you're kind of stuck on how i want to build a really interesting variable complex list for the players to choose from a two column mix and match is one way to super expand your horizons uh they chose punk cultists uh uh memory hungry ghosts uh scavenger demons uh and uh there's one more. I, I can't remember what the last one was, but but it 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 felt very fun and fruitful, and and players know who the oh oh street dragons. That was the other one. Uh, uh, and they, we don't quite know whether that's a literal streets or if it's a more metaphorical for what what that means. And but we're we're finding that out during play. Um, uh, other uh, questions or suggestions, things you've seen uh, or ideas. One of the things that I've been experimenting with the past few months is taking a lot of these tools and then incorporating them throughout play. Mm-hmm. And I found that this, this works really well with um, phased games like Blades in the Dark. Uh, so that in between like downtime and the score, there's a great moment there where we can revisit the tools and be like, okay, so we're going to this place. Let's figure out what this place is about before we actually get there. Uh, so you kind of doing it in a, a more uh, structured way, looking at like like places or factions or everything. What do you what do you? Um, so usually, what I've been messing around with so far is is deciding on large scale, um, broad things at the beginning during like a session zero. So we might mm-hmm. flesh out some factions and some themes, and then using those, we can develop some some pick lists or or things that narrow us down. So when we get to visiting a location. We draw from those themes that we established previously, and now we're getting into like the nitty gritty details and exploring those kind of dynamically as they come up. Um, 
and get that same kind of excitement in the moment. That's really great, especially with a, with Forge in the Dark, where there's often some question about where where we're actually interacting, where the RP is. I think that's a really, really wonderful way to, to, to combine that together with other things. Uh, other questions, suggestions, ideas? I'll, I'll show one more piece that I did here uh, recently. This again with the uh, samurai game. One of the things is, uh, one of the premises I had set up at the start was the idea that when we come into the game, there's a base premise that there's an emperor and that uh, there has been a battle against a big foe in L5R, which was originally kind of drawn from, this would be Fu Lang uh, or one of the other uh, figures there. So for this, what I thought was really important to set up is we did a set of questions at the start before we got too far into things about creating the foe. So as a group, they get to say what the foe is, who is the, the foe that was just defeated. And, you know, in the course of a uh, case of the one we did, uh, they chose, you know, a conspiracy, uh, a, a fallen lord who was corrupted by a kami that that was uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, struck down from the heavens. So that was cool. Kind of got that set. Uh, and then the players got to choose uh, some of the signs of corruption to say what what this supernatural foe, what this thing that we might be seeing in the course of play looks like. And uh they chose some really interesting ones of inhuman beauty being a sign of it, uh, sleepwalking, uh, strange obsessions. These are all really solid ones. Uh, and then we did some more aesthetic things like, okay, what is it? What is the corruption called? Uh, what tools, what things, what evidence of the foe still remains around? And like what kinds of places have been corrupted by the foe's touch? These are, are fun pick lists you can use them again and again uh and different different times you go with it, you're going to get very different campaigns uh out of that uh it is again one of those things that that we're establishing things that we are then going to reincorporate later on uh through this uh collaborative process anything else anybody else other ideas or or things you want to uh say about this no. I did notice that the document from earlier did have like quite a bit of pages. Like I, re I saw a forty-eight mark. Uh, how how you, how are you able to handle that many pages of like just text? So one of the things I've been doing recently, uh, uh, is I have taken a lot of my work is done, of course, in in the the Google Sheets and things like that. But I've been bringing them over into uh, documents. Or if I'm like modifying from existing a text, you know, I've I've brought that over, uh, and I'm very specifically now consciously at the start breaking things up into headings and using the heading tools in Google Docs because uh, that generates that index that you can have off to the side. Uh, once I started to do that, it made things much easier for me. Uh, because I could see what the document looked like and I could could break it down uh, and realize that there are only, like a lot of it is, okay, here are the moves. So this is text we might be cut, you know, bringing over from another place uh, where most of the work is actually going to fall into, you know, doing the pick lists or, or doing the, the collaborative and keeping track of those within the, the document. Um, but yeah, that that has taken me a while. Uh, uh, it, I would honestly say it's only this last year that I finally realized how easy it is to set up those, those indexing sections and, and use that as, as a graph. Does that, does that seem like a reasonable answer? Um, it is though an illustration of, of sometimes I spend too much time, uh, uh, doing a thing. Uh, that that maybe we're only going to get it to the table once, uh, you know that 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 is a a, a fault. Uh, but in the case like this, especially when we've got it broken down in pieces, 
That means maybe if I hack this again or I drift it again, I can easily take out the sections and port them in and I know where they are and and uh, attract that. Uh, the Changeling game that has become Hearts of Yokai has gone through four or five iterations uh, uh, each time, changing the list, building new things, uh, and so on, and getting different kinds of collaboration uh, uh, in terms of, of play and, and finding out what people want. Um, one of the, the things that I have discovered is uh, that you know players will often have a very different idea about what a game ought to be uh and that that's that shouldn't be a frustrating moment for a game facilitator it ought to be a great moment not because the player is negating what you've got but the player is excited about something you should always look and see when you see a player perk up at the table when you hear them ask about something a, a character or a place or a system I have always by me, even though, you know, writing online, I have a, a notebook. I am always writing down when I hear people reference something, when I hear people mention something. Now, I'm not an actual note taker in general. I don't really have session notes. Uh, if I really needed to, I would go and watch the video again. That's part of the reason it's a major part of the reason why I record uh, uh, the videos is so I can check like the last part of the session to see what the stars and wishes were or find a particular name. That's why I love Google Sheets and NPC tabs, especially when you have players that are obsessive about writing in the what each player uh, NPC does, because uh, I'm not doing that often. I'm just like, oh, who was that guy? Oh, look, Sherry wrote in who they are. Uh, these are these are a ways of of sharing the 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 burden. Uh, uh, but I do try to keep, keep track or write down or have names that people are excited about. Um, and, and my, my, my secret sauce for running is throwing as many NPCs as the players as possible and seeing which ones they like interacting with. Uh, and then we build from there. Uh, we, we kind of, uh, 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 the, the less interesting NPCs fall out. We find out who people are in love with, and then we break their hearts. Uh, that's that is our our general uh, goal here. Uh, any other questions? Any th other thoughts? Anybody has? I'd say that at risk of doing the the open questions. Uh, I, I think I think we're we're maybe set then. Uh, I will link this show notes uh in the the video for folks as well uh and if you have questions if you have ideas things you want to uh to talk about feel free to to, to send me a message i'm always curious about what other people are doing uh to do this uh i i like to get better each year i learn a different thing a different technique and i think that's that's wonderful a lot of this stuff you know i know uh, many of you already have a, a sense of it so uh, uh, it's, it's always good to, to, to get a refresher on that. Uh, so with that, I am going to thank you all for, uh, coming today and I'm going to allow myself to stop talking here in a moment and I am going to stop the recording. So thank you everyone.